Good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Glear. I'm the chief executive of Grenzebach Glear and Associates based here in Chicago. And let me welcome everyone to our session this afternoon. Um, I want to begin by welcoming our very special guest, Kate Azizi, the Vice President for Institutional Advancement at the Medical University of South Carolina. Uh, welcome, Kate. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Uh, we're delighted. Um, I think I want to remind everyone that this is a program that over the course of the last four or five months, we've reached out to a variety of leaders in the nonprofit field, particularly in, uh, in healthcare, in medicine, in human services. And we've asked those leaders to reflect a bit on their work and provide us some perspective on the challenges that we've all been facing in fundraising today. I'm delighted to have Kate with us today. Kate is a new leader in her institution in Charleston, and uh, she's gonna tell us a little bit about that. Uh, but first I wanna remind everybody that um, while we're not able to accommodate live questions uh, during our interviews, we absolutely welcome your questions either by chat or Kate has graciously agreed to accept questions directly to her LinkedIn file. So you're all invited to connect with Kate on LinkedIn. Uh, certainly we will take chat questions. Kate has agreed to address those questions afterwards and we'll post the answers uh, along with a uh, recording of this interview. So let's get started. Um, and let me begin, Kate, by asking you to share with us just a brief description of your new role at the Medical University of South Carolina. I understand that uh, you and your family arrived in Charleston shortly before the onset of COVID. And uh, tell us about that and give us a little sense of the scale of your advancement program, your staff, the range of its activities across this distinguished institution and its, uh, and its ambitions for philanthropic support. Sure. So yes, I did come. I, I started my new job in mid-February and um, my family moved here from Chicago and we were, um, my husband works remotely for his company and then we um, have two kids who started school and we were all going to work in school and then all of a sudden a month later, um, we all went remote. So it's been a really interesting time, but um, it's been incredible to be at MUSC. Um, I've learned so much. There's such innovation, um, such collaboration, sense of urgency, a lot of great work going on with um, COVID between testing, convalescent plasma, research, so much going on. So I'm just thrilled to be here. So in my role as Vice President of Institutional Advancement, I oversee the fundraising for the six colleges, the College of Medicine, the College of Nursing, College of Pharmacy, uh, the James B. Edwards College of Dental Medicine, the College of Health Professions, the College of Graduate Studies, and also the health system. And um, so our team is about 65 individuals and we raise philanthropic support for lots of different things, endowed professorships and academic programs, research, um, capital projects, uh, healthcare related initiatives and other needs. And in FY21, we raised over 88 million, which was our, our highest um, amount that we'd raised to date. Um, the team has, really done an, an incredible job. Um, a lot of that, most of that was raised before I even arrived. So um, I, I, I came into an incredible team. We have um, gift officers for all those areas, um, communications, advancement services, planned giving, annual giving, um, event specialists, and lots, and our administrative support team that helps make everything run smoothly. And then in addition, we have an MUSC foundation, and that's a separate 501c3, and that takes in the funds and invests them, and the Development and Alumni Affairs team works really closely with the foundation. We're really hand-in-hand -hand working with the foundation um, on all our projects. Uh, so, Kate, that sounds like a broad um, a set of programs. Are all six colleges staffed by your team? They are, yes. And, uh, um, uh, and the fundraising program, how long has it been established there over the years? Has it been in place so a long time? 
It's been in place. Um, the pers- it's been in place, I think, for about 40 years. So it's mm-hmm. been in place for a long time, but um, it actually has evolved and grown over time. Um, so, you know, we're, we're looking to grow and, um, you know, there will be hopefully opportunity for growth in the future for our team. Um, and, you know, it's, I think we have a great foundation here of a lot of excellent work and partnerships working with our donors and alumni over the years. And so really happy. To well, great. We'll, we'll circle back to the issue of what the future holds for you, but uh, let me shift for a moment and ask you, Kate, uh, I think there are lots of people, um, uh, our listeners, interested in sort of the arc of, um, of leaders as they move through the profession, the kinds of jobs and tasks they take on, what they learn along the way, and what causes them to make uh, decisions about uh, the variety of moves that really characterize senior professionals in our field. So if I could, let me ask you, uh, Kate, to talk to us a little bit about how you got started in the advancement field, how you actually got into fundraising. You've got a very interesting career arc. You started early on in in jobs and financial services, moved to the nonprofit field, then to higher education, uh, did a stint in veterinary medicine, in fact, and then finally Uh, medical fundraising in two very distinguished places uh, and part of two five billion dollar campaigns. That's quite an arc and I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about how it all got started. Sure, well um, I did start in financial services and I went through a management development program where I really learned a lot about um, managing and presenting to groups and Um, A lot about operations. I worked for a couple of different companies. And really what I realized was I was enjoying my volunteer work that I was doing for nonprofits. Um, And I I decided I wanted to switch into nonprofits. I really wanted to spend my time making a difference. Um, I'd done, you know, tutoring and I've done lots of races and walks and um, seen what philanthropic support can do to move the needle on research and education and different charitable causes. And so what I did was I, um, it's kind of interesting, I I saw this program on PBS and it was for this um, program called the Kids Weight Down Program. It was at Maimonides Hospital and it helped um, families develop healthy habits. It was part of the hospital program and I thought it sounded really interesting. So I called them and I asked if they wanted some help on their um, their grants or anything else. I didn't even know what I could help with, but I said, I'm, I'm here to help if you need anything. So the director of the program took me in and, and helped me and I worked there for a couple of months, just part-time looking up grants at the Foundation Center in New York and um, you know participating in their program with, with the families. And it was really interesting for me to see what a, what a hospital setting looked like. Um, and then I took a part-time temporary job managing an event for a nonprofit. I was able to parlay some of my project management skills into nonprofits, um, say, you know, pointing out that I could manage events. And then I managed events again, then eventually landed a position in a nonprofit in New York, um, a permanent position. And um, that was for development and working in development. And then we ended up moving to North Carolina for um, a job opportunity for my husband. I was a, I was a happy uh, trailing spouse and I saw this as an opportunity to take a job in higher education. I went to North, Car- North Carolina State University and worked at the uh, business school. Um, I think one of the things that's been really important is mentors over time. And the Dean of the Pool College of Management at NC State um, is still a mentor to me. Um, he, he just really helped me a lot. I, I learned from him about how to, how to write a proposal, um, how to, he was a great fundraising dean, and he actually suggested that I get my MBA. I was thinking about graduate programs, and he said, I think you should get an MBA, and so I did, and I got it at NC State. And during my um, time getting my MBA, I moved over to the College of Veterinary Medicine, and um, I, I worked on a project with a group in my MBA program, and we were told by our marketing professor that we could use data that was from our, um, you know, given to MBA students, or we could use data from our work. And so I got approval to use our data, 
our fundraising data and our um, hospital data and use formulas with my, my class group um, to figure out who would be most likely to give. Um, you know, how long was there, how long were they patients there? And um, because that veterinary hospital data wasn't, wasn't, you know, it wasn't affected by HIPAA. And so I could really dig into that data. Um, and then my marketing professor said he thought that sounded really interesting and he asked me to write a paper with him. So we did end up publishing a paper on this um, and that's where I really became interested in grateful patient fundraising. You know, Kate, that's a fabulous story. It's actually interesting that in building and looking at grateful patients around veterinary medicine, and we know that there are significant communities of grateful patients around veterinary programs, that it led you to, in fact, uh, very distinguished medical programs and, and live grateful patients. Um, and talk to me a little bit about uh, the, the fact that you did an MBA. Did you think that was a necessary ingredient to uh, growing in the field and expanding your leadership role? Well, I knew I wanted to go back to school for graduate school, and, and um, I thought about other programs as well. I felt like the MBA was versatile for me, um, and, and I, you know, I'm interested in economics, and I felt like it really did, has benefited me in my career as a fundraiser. Um, so I definitely, and, and I just love the program there, and I got lots of experience. Um, I'm still connected with my colleagues from the program. My, my classmates, I should say. So yeah. I thought it was great. That's great. So I, I want to circle back to something uh, that you started with. You, you made an interesting comment about um, it was what you got involved with as a volunteer that got you really curious about the nonprofit world. I ask this of almost every professional I encounter in the fundraising field. Uh, What's your earliest uh, recollection of fundraising? Were you exposed to philanthropy, uh, philanthropic experiences in your family as a young child? And, and as you reflect on that first job experience in fundraising, um, talk to us a little bit about what you learned from it that, um, that turns up in your career right, later on. Yeah, I was exposed to it as a child. Um, we did, you know, try to support different organizations. Um, and I think for me, it was just making sure that, that I was aware of, that I, that I was lucky and that others, you know, aren't as lucky, whether it's um, if they had illness or um, weren't as fortunate in many other ways. And so making sure we give back um, and I think that's something that was instilled in me by my parents. We raised a guide dog, um, puppy, you know, we, we did different things that helped, helped others. Um, so that was important to me. And um, one of the things I did was um, with my mother was to do a three day walk for breast cancer research. Um, we did that, um, you know, she wanted to do it for a big birthday. And I said, that sounds great. So I was definitely influenced by my family. Um, I would say over time, you know, seeing, seeing the impact of um, fundraising on, you know, whether I was working with some of the most at-risk kids in the lowest performing schools in New York, um, I saw the impact of philanthropy. I saw the impact of philanthropy at NC State when I saw scholarship students and met with scholarship students and their donors and heard about how they were the first um, person in their family to go to college and the scholarship enabled them to do so. Um, and really in my work, I would say in, at, at all the academic medical centers, seeing the power of philanthropy to impact research make a difference. I mean, look at COVID. Um, we have raised um, over $2 million from over 800 donors um, for COVID related projects, um, plus other grants as well. And you know, this, this funding has supported lots of things. It supported our own in-house PCR testing. It supported convalescent plasma. It's um, projects that supported a biobank. It supported um, the, the employees benefits payments. Um, we had to unfortunately lay off, um, it, you know, it was, there are some people who, whose hours have been reduced as well and we had some temporary layoffs. 
and their the payments they would have made on their and their benefits were paid for by um, donors, including two very generous anonymous donors. Serologic testing. So just see all these things that are possible because of philanthropy. I've seen that throughout my career, and that's why I love my career. I'm so happy I found it. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting to hear people reach back into their early childhood, talk about experiences with their parents and how they're exposed to multiple initiatives and how it plays out today. So um, go to the moment that you made the decision to move to Chicago and it led to you working with two very distinguished medical institutions, the University of Chicago and Northwestern. Um, what did you take, what, what took you to those initiatives from where you were in your career? And then what did you take away from them? Yeah, so um, we moved to Chicago, another, another career move for my husband, which was, I was fine with, I, I was ready for my next step. Um, and I got to the University of Chicago. So when I knew I was moving, I reached out to some different institutions. Um, and, and one of them was University of Chicago. And I reached out to Michelle Sheely. <laughs> she was um, heading up development at the time and University of Chicago Medicine. I said I was interested in-, in As many uh, of us know, she's a wonderful professional. She's incredible. And she responded and um, that got me to start, um, you know, she's now at Stanford, but she was there for a while. And um, I, I was able to meet with her um, and others in the group and eventually land at the University of Chicago. And I had a couple of really wonderful positions there, raising money for many different departments, working with principal gifts. Um, and I, I learned such an incredible amount there, um, building different gift opportunities, um, thinking, thinking big, um, and, and I really enjoyed, um, enjoyed that experience. And then what took you to Northwestern? So when I had, I remember when I reached out to different institutions, um, at the time I reached out to Northwestern, I think many years ago, I think they, they didn't have any openings, but I stayed in touch with my contacts. So I'd say that's another thing that I've really learned over time. Um, is to really build your, build your contacts. Um, people have helped me so much along the way, whether it's advice, there are too many people to name that, that I've benefited from their wisdom. Um, and and uh, they really help. And they, you know, when, when things open up, um, as they did at Northwestern, there was an opportunity for assistant dean of development. And I learned about it from, from that individual. And she um, brought me in and, and helped me learn about um, what the opportunity was. And I thought it was so incredibly exciting the work in the neurosciences at Northwestern is um, pretty incredible, and I, I really enjoyed my work there. And I, I learned a great deal um, there as well, um, partnering with faculty, working with leadership, um, working across different areas, um, and and uh, I, I really benefited a lot from that. So, well. so Kate. It's really interesting, this range of roles you've had and life's experiences have taken you from one to another. If you could pinpoint, just for a moment, uh, some of the skills that you think you've learned along the way that have really enabled you to take the new role that you've just taken, the leadership issues, the insight, what would it be? What would you point to as uh, the sort of whether it's accumulating set of experience or particular insights or skills uh, that you developed along the way? Anything you'd comment on? I would say um, there are things that are really important. One of the most important things is communication. I think that when you're working on a project and, and something um, doesn't go well, often it's because the communication hasn't been great. You know, someone doesn't know about a project who needed to or um, someone hasn't bought into a project or someone feels like they should have known about it. And so I think that um, making sure that you're a good communicator, um, that's very important. I try to communicate um, as, as much as possible. So because I've always benefited from that in my roles and working with different leadership. Collaboration is really important as well. So I think um, working together, working well with people, reaching across different 
different um, parts of the university or the health system. It's really important to do this because um, not only can you, can you learn from others, um, but I think donors really enjoy um, when they know that everyone is talking um, and that you're working together on a gift opportunity or stewardship. Um, also, those are people who have been my connections for a long time, and that's part of my, you know, the people I go to when I have questions or need advice or um, need someone in, in my network. Um, and, and I also help them, you know, I try to help them as much as possible if they have questions or issues, I, I help them just like everyone's helped me. Yeah. Um, so, so Kate, let's turn to the challenges that you are encountering in your new role um, and focus for a moment on this COVID pandemic. And uh, tell us a little bit about how your team pivoted, um, responded, and, uh, and indeed has begun to address the challenges that we all face. Sure. So um, we moved everything remote in mid-March. Um, so we had prepared for that. Um, we, we thought it was coming. Um, and so people do occasionally come into the office, but they practice all the protocols, masking and social distancing and all that. Um, I would say some of the things we did for our donors and alumni, um, we, we tried to raise awareness and provide a resource for them. So we do have a weekly COVID newsletter. We've switched it recently to every other week, but that features stories about our innovation, um, our resources. So where, how can you get tested? Um, we have virtual care. So how do you, how do you get virtual care? Um, you wanna make a gift? Here's how you can make a gift. Do you wanna donate some supplies? Here's how you, you do that. So we try to give them all that information. So it was really important for us to provide a resource tell them the great things that are going on at MUSC that, you know, we were, when, when I first came here, one of the things that was interesting to me is our telehealth program that's we're really a national leader. And so during this time, we've been able to help other universities. And I think it's brought a great sense of pride to MUSC alums. Um, also giving Tuesday. Now we had a focus on testing for uh, COVID-19. Um, Let's see, we've, I mentioned some of the great things that we've supported over time. Um, lots of research projects and programs. We have an emergency response fund, which allows us to be nimble. And we focused on COVID-19 fundraising exclusively for a few months. Um, we've been shifting to other needs as well. Um, but I think that everyone came together, I think all across the university, there's a great sense of urgency and collaboration with other universities as well. And, so we really tried to follow that lead. So talk just for a minute about um, this pivot to virtual engagement that obviously your entire team has, to, has had to embrace. Uh, give us a few examples, Kate. Uh, for example, how the team actually converted to virtual and how they've engaged, for example, major gifts who were in the pipeline and even uh, started new relationships if, if they found that to be possible? Sure. So we really work to collaborate um, across areas um, through different committees for our group. So we have everything from, um, you know, foundation relations. We have a diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, we have a social committee. One of the committees is events. And so what we're doing with that group is working together to share best practices and ideas across all our different areas. And some of the, the things that, um, that our team have done, we've had uh, lots of virtual board meetings on Zoom um, or WebEx with, our, with faculty presenters. We've had virtual graduation, um, drive-through graduation, um, we've had a lot of alumni engagement opportunities. So we just last week, our, our provost did a program with our alumni and we're gonna have that every month. Um, we have um, our newsletters that keep people engaged. I think that we're really focused on reaching out to donors um, and alumni and keeping them informed and checking in to see how they're doing. Um, we were able to move remotely quickly. Um, our, our amazing IT team um, was able to, to work with everyone to make sure they had a laptop um, that they could use, a, a loaner. And um, so, so we were able to move pretty smoothly into our remote efforts. 
if you review all the progress your team has made, and indeed sounds like you've been through it from graduation to uh, board meetings, um, what are the challenges that remain, Kate? What are you facing in the current environment that um, your team continues to grapple with? Um, what are the things in front of you? I guess I would say the unknown. You know, there's a lot of unknown about what's ahead. I wish I had a crystal ball um, so we could really predict, um, you know, what will happen in the future with a vaccine and all that. But um, I would say that one of the things that I would say for the future is there's been um, great success working remotely. So I think that, you know, there's, there's, I've always been a great proponent in, in, in working remotely at times. Um, and I think that we can see that we can be really successful doing that. Um, I really, you know, I think we all miss getting together, but, um, you know, remote has worked really well at this time. I'm trying to think of what else we grapple with. I would say, you know, I think we all just really miss seeing our, our donors and our alumni, our constituents, seeing our faculty um, in person. Um, but we're, I think the team has done an amazing job of um, collaborating still, even though it's virtual. Lots of virtual meetings, lots of calls, lots of seeing each other on a screen. Um, and eventually we will get back. So my first month here, I was able to go to two oyster roasts, which are a Charleston tradition. I'd never been to one before. And I really want to go to more. So, um, so I know we'll get there. So do you think at this point, even as let's say we come to a point where we have a vaccine and people are more comfortable getting out, are we going to retain some of the skills we built in virtual outreach engagement? Do you think it's here to stay? I think it's in fact, perhaps even a new normal in terms of how we engage with prospects. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, picking up the phone and calling someone is very meaningful. Lots of times our, um, the people we work with um, live in different states or live far away, or you just want to call and connect, or you want to send them an email with an update or an article. Um, and so I think, you know, and also working with colleagues, I think a lot of it is here to stay, and we've shown that it can be very successful and that we can do a good job working remotely. Do you think that, uh, in fact, uh, there are new tools that you'll expand upon in the future as you think, think about this in terms of uh, the reach to your communities? Absolutely. I think, um, I think checking in with people and having these virtual meetings is really wonderful. Um, people, you know, some, I was on a meeting this morning with a, a board and someone said it's my first time on a Zoom call. Um, but he, he learned and it was a really terrific meeting. He got an update from the Dean and um, we were able to share some exciting updates. So I think there are lots of great advantages. We'll use Zoom and WebEx and all those different tools. For sure. uh, that's great to hear. Let me ask this final question. I know there's some major gift professionals in our audience and, and uh, let me just ask, you've implied it. Have you successfully solicited large gifts virtually? Have you been able to take, um, the engagement and move it forward in a very productive way. Absolutely. I think many members of our team have, and um, I think that there are a lot of things that happen virtually, um, you know, being thorough, being responsive, being, um, you know, giving all the answers you need to give, providing um, information in writing, um, and providing them the you know, the knowledge that we're going to use that money for exactly what they intend. So last question, Kate, any, uh, any advice or thoughts you have for your colleagues in the audience as we continue to face the uncertainty, the unknown that you just talked about over the next uh, coming months? I would say continue to build your, build your network. Um, look to mentors, um, mentor others and, uh, I think it's really all about connection um, and, and give some thought to what's important to you in your career and what, what you want moving forward. That's really terrific advice, Kate. Listen, once again, let me thank you for doing this. We are out of time, uh, but let me say to all of our listeners again, Kate has graciously agreed to take questions. 
We're suggesting that you actually reach out to her in LinkedIn. It might be uh, the quickest. We're certainly willing to take questions on the chat line here. But I want to say to you, Kate, thank you so much for doing this. I know how much our audience values hearing from leaders in the field. And indeed, uh, you have taken on an extraordinary leadership challenge at the Medical University of South Carolina, and, wish you, and we wish you well. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you.